Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to the Enoch Pratt Free Library. My name is Vivian Fisher, and I am Deputy Chief of the Pratt Library State Library Resource Center. Before I begin our introductions, I want to remind you that we have some exciting programs for the month of February, March, and April. So in February, we will have Billy D. Williams here on February the 16th. Yeah. <laughs> and we will have Joanne Reed here on February the 24th. So book that on your calendar. And books for this evening's event can be purchased from our bookseller outside, just outside the door. Just to give you a few programming notes, we have about 45 minutes of conversation and about 15 minutes of Q&A. And there will be mics on both sides of the auditorium for your Q&A questions. So this evening, I am pleased to introduce our guests, Michelle Norris and Sherilyn Eiffel. Michelle Norris is one of America's most trusted voices in journalism, earning several honors over a long career, including Peabody, Emmy, DuPont, and Goldsmith Awards. She is a columnist for the Washington Post Opinion Section, the host of the Audible Original Podcast, Your Mama's Kitchen, and from 2002 to 2012, she was a co-host of NPR's All Things Considered. Norris is also the founding director of the Race Card Project, a Peabody award-winning narrative archive where people around the world share their reflections on identity in just six words. Her first book, The Grace of Silence, was named one of the best books of the year by the San Francisco Chronicle, the Christian Science Monitor, and the Kansas City Star. Before joining NPR, Norris spent almost 10 years as a reporter for ABC News covering politics, policy, and the dynamics of social change. Early in her career, she also worked as a staff writer for the, Los, for the Washington Post, Chicago, Chicago Tribune, and the Los Angeles Times. This evening's moderator, Sherilyn Eiffel, is a civil rights lawyer and scholar. From 2013 to 2022, she served as a president and director counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, Inc., the nation's premier civil rights law organization fighting for racial justice and equality. She recently served as a Ford Foundation Fellow and as a Clinsey Visiting Professor for Leadership and Progress at Howard Law School. Eiffel is currently the Vernon Jordan Distinguished Professor in Civil Rights at Howard Law School, where later this year she will launch the 14th Amendment Center for Law and Democracy. Eiffel holds a fellowship at the, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. This evening, our guests will be in discussion about Norris's book, Our Hidden Conversations, What Americans Really Think About Race and Identity. Please join me in welcoming Michelle Norris and Sherlyn Eiffel to the Pratt Library. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Hello, Baltimore. Oh, let me, I forget, Baltimore. I should know that because I'm married to a man from Baltimore who's right in the front row, Roderick Johnson. Represent, represent. And we rolled strong, so we have a big failing oh, family, Baltimore family, 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 family in here family. tonight. Thank you all for coming out. 
So you are obviously as thrilled as I am that we have the honor of having this conversation with Michelle Norris. Now, you should know that Michelle and I have known each other for a number of years. Um, we are joined by a, a cord that can never be broken. Um, Michelle was the and is <laughs> the best friend of my late cousin Gwen, and so um, that has bound us together. Yeah, and and Gwen has her own Baltimore roots. She does Baltimore roots. She does. She, she does. worked here for the Sun and mm -hmm. covered Maryland politics she for sure a very did. long time in the, in the days of Schaefer. Um, and before I met Broderick, introduced me to beating up my food with crabs. <laughs> okay, get it right. Um, so, so, so we know each other, and I say that because the way I'm going to be in conversation with Michelle will reflect the fact that we know each other and that we are friends. But we have not really talked about this book since it was published. Um, and um, I have to say I'm overwhelmed by it. And Michelle knows this. I, I knew what the book was, I thought what the book was gonna be. Um, I knew about the race card project, which we're gonna talk about in a moment. But I just have to tell you that when this book arrived and I saw this stunning, stunning book, I was overwhelmed. It is absolutely beautiful. And that matters um, that the book is rich and luxe and makes you want to read it. Now I have um, two, one that sits on my coffee table, my inscribed book, um, you know, upgrading my, my living room. And then this is my walkabout copy that I, you know, that I, that I have my, all of my tabs on and so forth. And so I wanna first of all, just congratulate you on the beauty of this book. It's not easy to uh, write or read about race. And you kind of have to draw people in. And this matters that this book is so beautiful, that it makes you want to open it, that the photographs are incredible, that the pages feel so lovely, that you can put it down and pick it back up. Um, and so I want to congratulate you for that. Thank you. And I know you had a lot to do with the yeah. look. <laughs> of the book. Yes. Yes. I thank you. Thank you for noticing that mm -hmm. because it was it was really important that this be a jewel box book that I wanted it to be inviting because you know let's face it r race is tough. And we are all experiencing a little bit of fatigue around this right now. So I knew I had to draw people in. Um, I drove some people crazy with this. Uh, my agent is also she's laughing. <laughs> She's covering her face in love. <laughs> um, my longtime agent, Gail Ross, who is also working with you now, uh, knows that, you know, the cover, I just had a vision. I wanted the cover to reach out and grab you. And uh, we went through a lot of different iterations, and I called Kadir Nelson, who is an old friend. I've known him for Three brilliant decades. artist, does some of the most beautiful covers of the New Yorker magazine, for those of you who subscribe. And so he, he said, I got you. And he came up with this, and it's called Totem, and it's meant to represent, you know, every oh, facet of America. It. And I wanted the book to have a beating heart. I wanted it to almost leap off the page into your life, and that's why there, there are 287 photos in the book. And again, that's why I drove, you want how many photos in this book? <laughs> what? You want it full color? You want different fonts? You want, you want little pages in between that are certain colors, and even the color... You know, the color that we chose, bottom, yeah. this um, is repeated in the book, this beautiful terracotta color. And I was like, no, that's not it. It has to be more rich, not so orange. Because I wanted it, again, this is a color that represents, for some people, it's the color of the land. Mm -hmm. You know, if you live in the South and you've, you know, been to Georgia or Alabama mm -hmm. or Southwest mm -hmm. and it gets on your tennis shoes, it ain't never coming out. For some people, it's the color of their cookery. For some people, it's the color of their skin. For some people, it's the color of the patina of bronze that it takes, you know. So it was a color that was really intentionally chosen because I wanted it to, I wanted to signal different things to different people. And it's a book that's meant, you can read it front to back mm -hmm. if you want to. Mm -hmm. And I hope, you know, some of well, you will. Well, I did, but... But you can also just pick it, pick it up. But I pick it up. Yeah. yeah. But, e but even if you've read it front to back, you can pick it up and flip to any moment in it and just 
uh, sit in that moment, because there are moments in this book that wrap around you. Now, even though I know that you drove uh, Gail crazy, I think it's important to say that, um, you know, Gail can be driven crazy, but is powerfully supportive of your vision. And yes. this matters for yeah. those of you who are thinking about yeah. writing or doing any creative project, is that whoever is representing you, whoever is the person working with you, has to believe in you and, and has to be willing to do. And she did. Do. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. she fought, you fought for me and you pushed and it really made a difference um, to, to push people out of their comfort zone in, in the book and even in the audio. So if those of you who like audiobooks, the audiobook, since I'm an audio gal, you know, I wanted to I wanted to break mm -hmm. form in the book and I wanted to break form in the audiobook. So there are 12 essays that I wrote, epilogue, introduction, mm -hmm. prologue. Mm -hmm. And then in between every essay, there's a river of stories, of six word stories. And some of them are just six words, and some of them are six and words like with backstories. And mm -hmm. some of them have photos. But I wanted to also make sure that the people who were telling their stories could read those stories themselves. So if you listen to the audio book, mm -hmm. you'll hear me reading my essays, mm -hmm. but you're going to hear people telling their own oh, stories nice. in their own that's dialect and nice. their own um, accent. Uh, you hear, you know, America's geography, you hear oh, America's humanity yeah. because you hear so many different Americans telling their own stories. That's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. Okay. So caveat, Michelle is the professional interviewer. I am an attorney. <laughs> and so I'm going to shamble my way through this process of interviewing someone who does it better than anyone and try not to make it a cross-examination. Um, but I'm, I'm going to treat it like a, like a conversation that we would have. And I want to really begin to jump right into it because I think this book is so important at this moment. So I know that, and we all know that this book comes out of the work of the Race Card Project. And so I think it's important first to just a table set with you explaining for those who may not know or may not be familiar with it what the race card project is why you started it um what it what you were able to assemble and collect and learn from that extraordinary project that led you to this book so i called it the race card project because i hate the phrase you're playing the race card anytime someone has said that to me it feels like they're telling me to shut up they are in fact playing the race card yeah. I mean, they, they are, it's, it's, I'm being gaslit and I've, I've never liked it. And it's also imprecise. Like, what is it about what I'm saying that's making you uncomfortable? So I decided to call it the race car project to, instead of shutting down a conversation to try to stoke a conversation. And I decided to do this in the, in the first place, um, because I had written my first book, which was about my family's very complex racial legacies, things I'd learned from my mother and father that I never knew about their lives, that my, father was shot in the leg by a policeman when he was um, quite young and returning from his military service, trying to enter a building where he could learn as much of the, about the Constitution as he could so he could pass a poll test. And he never talked about that. And I learned that my mother's mother was an itinerant Aunt Jemima, that she traveled the country doing pancake demonstrations when convenience cooking was new. And neither one of them had talked about this. And so I wound up writing a book about my family's very complex racial legacy. And I knew what I was going out in the world. I'm, I'm a journalist. I, at that time, was working for NPR, was cloistered much of my time in a studio. This was my chance to go out in the world and talk to people. And I knew we were going to be having conversations about race, and I thought it was something that no one wanted to talk about. So the Race Card Project was an invitation to invite people into the conversation. And I went to a Kinko's near... Um, in Northwest Washington, and I had these postcards printed up. And they said, race, your thoughts, six words, please send. They were designed by someone who can't be here tonight because she's not feeling well, and this was supposed to be her stop. But my partner in the race card project for 14 years has been Melissa Bear, who lives in Towson, Maryland. <laughs> and um, she's sorry that she can't be with you, but she designed these cards. And we started to leave these everywhere I went. I was on a 35-city book tour. And I didn't know if people would send in postcards. I mean, I, I don't even remember why I chose postcards. My parents are postal workers. I was supporting the US Postal Service in some way. <laughs> but people started to send the cards back. Sometimes they would hand them to me like some of you have done tonight. But in many cases, they put a postage stamp 
and sent it in. And the cards that were coming in were so interesting that within about a year, we created a website so you all could see what was coming in our inbox. And then we allowed people to submit digitally. So most of the cards that we get, the submissions that we get now come in digitally. In 14 years, we have officially archived more than half a million cards. We have thousands that are waiting to be officially archived. And by archived, I mean we go through them very carefully and tag them so we can find cards that have certain themes that if you want to find all the cards from Tennessee, all the cards about travel, all the cards about military service, you know, we take the archive seriously. But, but Michelle, let me just, just stop you. As I recall, I think I'm right about this. When you started this project, it was at a very volatile time. I think it was 14 years. So maybe it was when... 2010. Um, yeah, I think it was when maybe when when Eric Garner was killed. There was there was some it was, racial it was moment before happening. That. It was before that. It was 2010. We had just sent a black family to the White House, and Americans were talking about being post-racial. Well, we had also, but we had also had the beer summit. Yes, right. We had the beer summit. We had had so, uh, and it was the social minors confirmation. Yes, we, we were having a lot of race conversations, as I recall, when this started. And we were also having conversations that were not about race, that were racialized. That's right. So we were starting to see town yeah. halls where people were showing party, up and saying, stuff. "I want my country back." Um, we were starting to see um, patriotism displayed in a different way that that had sort of a one-way handle on it and all this was happening yeah, while america that. was talking about being allegedly mm -hmm. post-racial post -racial. yeah i do remember that it was a there was a moment um and this seemed to fit right into that moment um so we were surprised by how many people responded but i take it you were also surprised or maybe uh, overwhelmed by what you were hearing and the diversity of what you were hearing in those six words. So can you say a little bit about yeah. what you were hearing and how you, uh, it feels like an enormous responsibility, right? To, to you just, you, I mean, I heard the way you said they put a stamp on it, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? That people cared enough and wanted to be heard enough that they were willing to send it in the mail to someone they didn't know. Yeah. So, so talk a little bit about that. Well, the intention caught my attention. Mm -hmm. And I realized, well, wait a minute, we're doing something here. People are sending us things that I don't think they say out loud. And then when we started collecting stories digitally and we allowed people to share their six words and a backstory, they would say in the backstory, I've never told anybody this. When you keep getting stories from someone who's saying they've never shared this with anyone, you realize that you're con the conservator of something really really special. And I was surprised in, in the best way by what people could pack into just six words. Mm -hmm. You know, early on, it became really clear that this was a really potent way to communicate. White, not allowed to be proud. You said dirt, so I scrubbed. Will he be, will my son be American enough? Boyfriend visited, Nana called the police. Uh, you know, over and over again, cards like this. No, my name is not Maria. Uh, sometimes using humor. May I ask the audience a question? Sure. Okay, one of the cards that came in. Lady, I don't want your purse. <laughs> and I love that card, and for a while... At, at the race card project, my little teeny mighty team, small, tiny, but mighty team, we would reach into the inbox and we had business cards made, we would put six words on them. So Melissa, who can't be here tonight, her six words were, grandma, you can't say that anymore. That's good, that's and good. That's a good one. <laughs> and Amrit Dillon, who is South Asian, no, I don't like spicy food because she's South Asian and people would always put like the hottest of the hot sauce in front of her and she'd be like, I can't eat that, I don't want that. And mine was always, lady, I don't want your purse. And I liked it because um, we have a few versions of that card, but I like it because he's using humor to talk about something very real. So may I ask the audience a question? Yes, please. So I want you to please be honest. How many of you have gone to a neighborhood and walked down the street and you see someone who doesn't look like you 
or you walk into an elevator and someone walks in and they're different than you, and you don't even know why you do it, but you grab your purse a little bit closer to you. Or lock the car door. I've done that. Yeah, or lock the car door. Anybody do that? <laughs> Raise your hand if you've done that before. Yeah. And the car doors is hard because the car doors now are loud. I know. So, you know, and you hit the car door and someone looks at you, doom, 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 you know, you're yeah. busted. It, it, yeah, I, and did, someone I just looks did at it you, like two yeah. weeks ago. Yeah. yeah, and someone looks at you like, lady, I don't want your purse. Other side of that, how many people have had that happen to them? You walk in an elevator. I didn't even finish the sentence and Jason's hand goes up. You know, where have, and someone raises, you know, it is just, you don't, I don't want your purse. And, and so the person who grabbed their purse, they go on with their day. They don't even know why they do it. They go on with their day. The person who watched someone grab their purse, they go on with their day too, but that lives inside them. That's a little, it, it cuts. And, and so another six word story that we collected three weeks ago in New York, I think is a wonderful antidote to that. Someone heard me talk about lady, I don't want your purse. And, and he wrote his six words, I'm not intimidating. You are intimidated. Ooh, I love that one. Put that on the card, on the business card. Yeah. Yeah. Because that just turns it around. I this love is it. not about me. Yes. This is about something yes. inside you that has led you to be cultured such that you see me and you automatically yes. are afraid. Yes. And that one is across genders. I mean, many of us as, as black girls have, have had people tell us that they were intimidated in some way by us or that we were intimidating. And, and that's very, very powerful. And also just that. gendered, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. if, if women start to show some Assert sort of authority, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. authority, they're seen as bossy or shrill, shrill, a word that is never, ever, mm -hmm. ever applied no. to strident. Strident yes. is another one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. To, yes. to men. We could do that all night, but let's get into the book. Let's get, let, I, I really, I really want to get into the book and um, I'm having a little trouble choosing um, some of the subjects here because so many of these things were painful. Even for me to read, even when they had nothing to do with me, um, I found the sections about transracial adoption really hard to read. I found the sections about passing really hard to read. Um, and I, and I, I wondered as I was reading it, why, am I, why is this so hard for me to read? I, you know, Tell me what... Passing was interesting because... And this, I, I, I learned a lot about my own blind spots in doing this work, I had thought passing was something that primarily applied to black people passing into whiteness. You know, because we had seen imitation of life, we had, you know, read books that, that you know, dealt with this. And I have so many stories in the inbox about passing, but people are passing all kinds of ways. Yeah. So people are choosing only to be indigenous when they go home. Um, people are passing out of a religion. They're no longer Jewish. They're passing because they happen to live in a part of the country where it's just really easier to say that I'm Mexican than to say that I'm another, you know, from another part of the Latino diaspora because if I want that loan, if I want to get this business, you know, it's just better to be Tejano, you know, and so I'm just going to roll with this. So, and it was interesting how fluid our identities you know, can be. I was one thing in college, I was another thing later on. Many of the stories about passing, one of the little epiphanies I had, is that how it isn't intentional. That often when people are passing, it's not like they woke up and decided, today I'm not going to be so that Somebody anymore. mistook them and they yes. didn't correct it. And they didn't correct it. Yeah. And then they just rolled with it, you know, and then it just became this kind of snowball and then it just kept going. But it's, they they kind of you know, fell into something. And one of the um, interesting stories is not in the book that we got early on that I've always thought would be so interesting for us a, a story to like delve into, you know, in some way. Someone had passed all her life and um, was starting to enter a stage of dementia. And the person who wrote in, it was very, it was like, I think 2000, it was like the first year we were doing this. And the person who wrote in is the one person in her family that she kept in touch with. Mm back home. 
And she was trying to decide if she should go get her and bring her home to be with her people or let her stay where she was, but she was having, because she was experiencing dementia, her short-term memory was starting to fry, but her long-term memory was redolent. So she couldn't remember who she was supposed to be, but she had strong memories of who she really was. Wow. Yeah. And she wrote this whole story about whether she was gonna go get her and bring her home or not. Do you think this is a generational thing? I mean, there's a, there are many stories in this book that are about uh, people who see their birth certificates and learn um, <laughs> things about themselves. Um, you know, people who learned about, we were talking earlier about siblings they didn't know they had, and we should probably talk about that story for a minute. Um, and I wonder if this is a generational thing. Are we about to pass out of the time when that used to happen more readily? I don't know. Do you I don't know. I don't know if we're passing out of the time where, you know, because we don't have the strictures around race that we used to have. Mm -hmm. But you can check. You can check a lot of different. You can boxes. check a lot of different boxes. You can be a lot of different things. You can marry who you want. You can live allegedly where you want. You can work in places, but it doesn't mean that there are still there are still barriers to opportunity. Well, well people didn't mostly pass because of law. They mostly passed because of the fear of censure in their families, right? Right. Or or because of opportunities. They mm -hmm. could just That's they right. could just That's fly right. further. They could go further if they were one thing as opposed to another thing. But I'm reticent to say that it's over because the, uh, another one of the little epiphanies in the book is um, how often DNA comes up. You know, so many people discover something because somebody did a DNA test or someone, you know, spit into a vial and sent it off to 23andMe or something like that. And I watch those commercials on TV and I'm like, oh, you could really do a different commercial than this because it's... <laughs> It's always like I thought I was Greek, and I'm actually nor you know I'm from Norway, and See, it's now like I think about it from the from the criminal investigation perspective <laughs> myself. <laughs> no, but it's like you know people realize like I thought I was one thing, and I realize I have family members, and and so you know I don't it, because of technology, but also because of the strictures are not legal anymore. They're not our our laws and our mores have changed, but I think that we are still a culture of secrets. I think people still carry secrets with them and people sometimes still bevel the edges, you know, off certain aspects of their life. So it may happen less often, but I don't think that we are completely passing out of an era where people reinvent themselves. Do you want to tell the story about the mom who gave away the children? Yeah, or do you it, wanna, I, I, think, I think it's helpful because there's so much pain and confusion in that story. Yeah. And I do think it's important for us. We tend in this country to talk politically about race, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. But not really about the heaviness of some of what has been imposed on us um, and what we've been compelled to deal with as a result of this um, artificial structure that we have um, had, to, had to live in. We know that race is not biological. We know that it is um, a social construct, and what, but what a construct it is. Yeah. And Race is made up, but the consequences are very well. That's right. That's right. So I, I think I want you to, to tell that story just because uh, it, it's just easy to see how crazy it is, but also how real it is yeah. um, for, how, for people. And how challenging it was for me because I wanted to present it in a neutral way. So there's a chapter in the book called Breadcrumbs. And when you read the book, and notice I said when you read the book, um, you will encounter this chapter where there are several stories about people. The word grandma and grandpa comes up over and over in the archive because people are often talking about how different their lives are than the elders in their family or something they discover from the elders in their family uh, and in realizing that they had left clues all along. So there's a story in this chapter uh, about a woman who receives a phone call one day from someone who says, hi, my name is Ed, and I think I'm your brother. And she's like, he wants something from me. He's a telemarketer. I'm not going to take him seriously, except he says certain things about her mother that only certain people would know. Like her mother doesn't use her given name, but he knew her. That name was Wilhelmina. And she's like, ooh, how do you know that? He knew a few other things. So she called her mom 
she kind of sat on this and then she went to work, couldn't work. She called her mom. Mom is up in years. And she said, mom, did, did you have a son at some point? And this is where I want you to, I really want to suggest that even if you read the book, that you listen to the audio book, because this entire chapter is in their voices. Oh, really? Okay. So she calls her, and, and Diane had recorded her mother. Diane is white. And Ed, who called her, she doesn't know what color Ed is, because he just called her. And if you listen to Ed, I've interviewed him several times, you wouldn't know. And her mom says, oh... Years ago, I had a baby, and I just couldn't take care of him. I was a telephone operator, and things just didn't look good for us. And so I had to give him up. He was a black child. And what's interesting, if you listen to the audio tape, Diane at that point, when she's telling me the story, starts laughing. And she's like, I mean, <laughs> wow. You know, that's kind of her reaction, like, that's another wrinkle. And, you know, <laughs> and but that's the way you would tell the story, right? Yeah, that's yeah. why it's so interesting yeah, to yeah. hear her do this, because that's the way you would tell a story to a friend, right? And so she's like, she can't work the rest of the day. And she, Ed calls her back and she's like, well, I've been an only child all my life. I have a brother. This is kind of cool. Should I tell the rest of it? <laughs> and so she's kind of thinking, I have a brother. And he says, well, did she tell you about the rest of us? <laughs> I see your face. Ooh. <laughs> and she had four children, um, four mixed race children, black, white children, um, but society saw them as black because she was a white woman living in San Francisco. And even in liberal San Francisco, she couldn't find housing. Her family wanted nothing to do with those kids. Don't you bring those babies back here. We don't, mm, no, 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 no. They're not coming here. So she had, she didn't think she could provide for them. And so she decided the, the, the deal she cut with herself was that all four kids had to stay together. So all four kids went to a black family in foster care. This story wrung me out. You know, I talked to Diane, I talked to her brother. Diane had recorded her mother. I heard the recordings of her mother. Again, if you listen to the audiobook, that's there. And I had to figure out how to tell the story in a way that didn't, that you wouldn't judge yeah. the mother. You know, because there are lots of ways. And so this was a challenge for me often because people are revealing really difficult things in a way that you would understand her but not manipulate it so it would be maudlin. So it was really a challenge to sort of tell these stories. In that chapter, I decided to do it almost like a Rashomon. So it's it's just their voices. You get it's, out of the way and I you get let out the of different the perspectives yeah. Yeah, speak. Yeah. So powerful. So you know you have to buy this book, right? I mean, <laughs> that in and of itself is like a TV movie right there. Um, uh, so one of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about is culture, just because um, in the plat on the platform formerly known as Twitter, um, there would be these viral moments where there would be this uh, maybe pretense or veneer of kind of cross-cultural sharing, right? Um, some of you may remember the conversation about whether white people use washcloths and about seasoning food and the ways in which we have these um, ideas about one another that, that the um, exposure of integration was supposed yeah. to expose us to the ways that different people live um, and, and, and the, the customs. I mean, I always remember Vernon Jordan saying that... Um, you know, he, he when he grew up in Atlanta and he had a white friend who uh, walked by his house uh, one night when he and his family were having dinner and he didn't have any shades on the window or the shades were up. And the friend later said to him, and I saw you having dinner with your family, just like white people, that you were sitting around a table having dinner, you know? And so there are all of these ways in which, you know, we can be so separated from one another and just not understand the customs. And there's a bit of that in this book where people say, they talk about the seasoned food or other things. How did you characterize those things? What, what do you make of those things? I, I think, you know, people are, are curious about 
other people's lives. Mm -hmm. and, and, there, and there are cards that, you know, white people don't season their chicken is one of the cards. And then there's what, and there's preludes and echoes throughout the book. So I wanted the cards to be in conversation. And then later you meet someone who says, I don't season my chicken. I wear Hawaiian shirts. I, you know, when he yeah, just explains, yeah. but this is, I got to confess. <laughs> yeah, I got to confess, but this is who I am. And I don't, I'm, that's me. You know, I don't want someone telling me that that's, that I'm supposed to be um, something else. I think that a benefit of a book like this, certainly for me as a storyteller, but really for anyone in America is we live lives that are more siloed than they used to be. We have more devices that allow us to communicate, but it doesn't mean that we're better informed. We consume a media diet that affirms or confirms so much of what we already believe. So we just don't have those sort of communal big spaces where we see each other. And in the book, I liken this when I was, in, I grew up in an integrated neighborhood and I grew up in a working class neighborhood. So no one had air conditioning. So in the summer, the windows were all open and you heard everything, yeah. you know, because you just heard everything. You knew who was, having arguments, you knew who was listening to new music, you knew who got the Jackson 5 first, you know, the Jackson 5 next new release. And this book feels like roaming through America's neighborhoods with the windows open. At a moment where everyone has their windows open and you can hear people say the kinds of things that you usually don't get to hear them say out loud. And there's some benefit in that because yes, we will see differences, right? But you're also when you read these stories, I think you will find that even in stories that you have nothing in common with them, but there's some little piece of that story that resonates or reminds you of a town that you once visited or reminds you of a summer camp that you went to or reminds you of, you know, some place that you saw on some vacation or something. And so I'm not going to pretend that this book is going to make us all like see each other and suddenly sing Kumbaya but you're going to see both the differences and some possibility of, of some sort of, you know, common, commonality in, in the human experience that might, might, might just contribute in a positive way to this moment. I, I will say the part that did it for me was a sense of shared struggle around the concept. Mm -hmm. I don't mean shared struggle in terms of access to housing, education, and so forth. We know what those racial divides are. We know what the racial wealth divide is. We know what um, encounters with law enforcement can mean for young black people or older black people for that matter. So it's not to deny any of that, but trying to figure out the terms. And I, you know, so I'm a civil rights lawyer. And one of the things that has um, been difficult for me is that I'm very comfortable talking about race because I talk about race all the time. And sometimes I miss the fact that the person I'm talking to doesn't talk about race all the time. And the conversation we're having for them feels very heavy. And for me, it feels like we're just having a conversation. Um, and one of the things I loved about this book was how, how much it showed that, that everyone's kind of struggling with the terms of what you can say, of how you do say it, of um, even the confusion. You know, we, we say race. But sometimes there's colorism, yes. right? There's language as being Latino, but you don't speak Spanish. And what does that mean? Are you inside and outside of your community, right? Um, or you're Latino and you're not from a Spanish speaking Latin American country. I mean, there's so many ways in which the boxes don't fit and people are trying to navigate their way. And how often that happens. So one of the big surprises for me in doing this work is in 14 years of collecting stories, in the majority of the years that we were collecting stories, the majority of the submissions have come from white Americans. Big surprise. Because when we have conversations about race, it's usually led by black people. It's usually in February. It's usually- Here we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not as inclusive as maybe it should be. And I didn't know that I was going to embark on a 14 year odyssey of listening to white Americans talk about race. I didn't even think that was possible. And yet so many people, and I think it was the modeling of the website that when we created the website, people would see the stories and say, oh, I, ooh, I get to share my story too. And because we have so many stories from white Americans, it's, it's not a, like, it's, it's a broad diaspora of stories. So you see lots of different things. And to your point about culture, 
there are a lot of divisions within white America also on this issue. You know, someone says, all the racists look like me. You know, and he's, because of where he lives, because of how he dresses, because he likes red baseball caps that don't say MAGA, they're just red. You know, he says that people automatically assume that he's rolling with the dudes who, you know, ransacked the Capitol on January 6th. Um, you know, someone who who feels, I, I'd never heard this phrase before, if you ain't Dutch, you ain't much. <laughs> Very common saying in parts of Pennsylvania. You know, where if you were not part of a, you know, a certain tribe of people, you were not accepted, you know, in the same way. So in, in a lot of um, consternation and defensiveness about what do I get to say and what does race, you know, mean to me? Suddenly people are assuming that I, um, I don't have a seat at the table. If I say something, I'm going to offend someone. So it, it really was an education to me because I have not had an opportunity to talk about race with, with white Americans, um, either on a broad scale or, or on an intimate scale. And there are real divisions. And we kind of assume in the way that people, black people bristle when people talk about black America, mm -hmm. you know, we can do the same thing with white America also. Mm -hmm. Um, when we talk about working class America, there's an assumption that we're really talking about working class white America and a certain cohort within working class white America. So language um, can be sort of overlaid onto groups of people in, in very lazy and, and sometimes even dangerous ways. How did you deal with, uh, you, you, you referred to the woman with the four children earlier and how you tried not to be judgmental. There were moments in the book, you know, the black man who says, I'm glad my child looks white or I'm glad my child is, these moments where it's an uncomfortable, I mean, it looks like you just kind of let it s sit there for itself. But how do you encounter that? Kind, that feels much more personal. Um, well, there, there are some, you know, I'll give you an ex another example. And I just talked about this in another interview recently. Uh, someone wrote in, um, white privilege, earned it, enjoy it. And then he explained in his backstory that every important advancement in American society has happened because of white men. And you owe us a debt of gratitude and not your scorn. You see why she is the interviewer and I'm the civil rights lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that, in interviews, that one comes up again and again because people are like, now, why did he get his story in the pages of this book? You're cut. <laughs> you know? And I'll tell you why. Because we're holding a mirror up to society. And we're holding a mirror up to society on the issue of race. And so we want you to see the lived experience of race in all of its many demonstrations, all of its many facets. And... So he gets he he gets to be in this book because that's his it's point important. of view. Mm -hmm. And also because as I think about America and I think about the education system that he probably went through. Is it any surprise? It's not surprising that he thinks that, you know, my daughter attended a wonderful university. And I remember kind of just every time I stepped on campus, looking at the great writers that were inscribed on the wall. You know, Toni Morrison wasn't up there. No, 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 no. James Baldwin wasn't up there. I mean, so if you, if you attended school in this country, if you watch television in this country, if you um, breathe the air in this country, you could come to that conclusion. And when we are siloed, and when we are in a moment where we don't want to look in our, in our rear view mirror and look at our history, it's easy to understand how you could come to that conclusion. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I will tell you I don't you agree that with it, but I understand how people we're jump to lot, that. We're having lots of conversations uh, these days, finally, at long last, about the 14th Amendment um, because of the cases that are happening involving uh, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment and President Trump. And I studied the 14th Amendment and... Um, the first line of the 14th Amendment is about birthright citizenship, right? It says anyone, any person born or naturalized in the United States is a citizen of the United States and the state in which they res reside. And this was a powerful, very, very powerful articulation of citizenship. 
it was created for the purpose of ensuring that black people, both formerly enslaved and free, would be citizens. It was meant to overturn the Dred Scott decision, which said black people could not be citizens. So that one line, that's just the first line of the 14th Amendment, essentially creates the new America. It creates this America. Um, because the, the, the waves, just to counter your, your, the man you interviewed, the waves of uh, European immigrants in the 20th century come and almost immediately their families pass into being American, something that was not possible all over the world. You know, you were German because your parents were German. You were French because your parents were French. Birthright citizenship was, um, now it's much more prevalent, but was not then. So in fact, it is this thing that was meant to ensure black people's citizenship actually uh, benefited, redounded to the benefit of generations of white immigrants, um, many of whom now scorn immigration, uh, who, who became American within one generation. And I wanted to tell you that this book for me um, feels so much like an articulation, a presentation, a, a vision of the 14th Amendment, of the creation of this new nation, of our second founding. This is our second founding. And I think it is in incredibly important to feel the richness of it, the beauty of it, even when you know you encounter uncomfortable ideas. This is the America that those framers meant to create after the Civil War, and I thank you for that. Thank you, thank you. You know, I write about America. That means, don't you just love to listen to her talk about the Constitution, just rattle off the amendments? I could just, you know. But I write about America in a in a very particular way in the book. Because there are a lot of people who are citizens of this great country who don't feel, and you can choose the adjective, they don't feel fully American, they don't feel authentically American, they don't feel like America is, is theirs in some way because there has been this sort of gatekeeping around the flag and gatekeeping around patriotism. And um, what, what I write, and this book is how grateful I am to have been raised by parents who were kind of crazy about the flag. Yeah, my dad like flew the flag. He was a veteran and in his rose garden planted little flags. And um, in, you remember the bicentennial if you're old enough to remember that? Oh man, he wore the sweater and the socks and the, you know, the decals on the car. I mean, he was just, you know, my, my son is here and you go visit Grandma Betty, she has that blue sweater with the flags all over it. She's still, you know, they were flag-waving people. And today, flag-waving people are generally people who are trying to claim America as theirs. And theirs alone. And theirs alone. And so I was so grateful to have been raised by flag-waving people because it helps me to my own children explain how to love a country even when it might disappoint you. And and in the pages of the book, I encourage people, fly the flag. It's yours too. You know, don't let other people take that away from you. Because if, if, if you concede that, you know, you, you lose your claim to a country that is all of ours. Yes, 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 yes. It is. It is, uh, it, is, it is the equivalent of my hearing Barbara Jordan talk about the Constitution yes. <laughs> and claiming it for herself. Yeah. So one of the things I love in this book is the I wish section. And I got to find it. But there's a section of the book in which people talk about, uh, it's, it's very sad, actually. It's kind of a little bittersweet. But people talk about what they wish, what they, um, what they wish about race. And it's very personal and very beautiful. And I wondered if you could read some of these wishes before we... Sure. So it begins on the bottom of page 420. The cards are curated carefully so that some cases they're together because they are themes and then because race is chaotic. In some cases, you feel like all kinds of stories are coming at you from all different directions. But this is one where we had so many people who wished for something in some way. And so... I wish I had lighter skin. I wish I hadn't said. I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I had I had learned Gujarati. I wish I reflected my heritage. I wish I had your tan. I wish demographic questions didn't exist. I wish my beauty was equal. 
I wish we were all creamy brown. I wish we could ignore it. I wish racist, racist whites would just chill. Would chill. I don't want to go seven words. Okay. <laughs> I wish we were all colorblind. I wish this didn't separate us. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Norris. Our hidden conversations. What Americans really think about race and identity. So we have a couple of minutes for questions, um, one or two. And um, before people start leaving, you really want this book. I don't know if we are at the stage yet where we give Black History Month presents, but if we did, this would make a very attractive <laughs> present. We can start it this month here today. I don't see why we shouldn't start it in Baltimore. Um, get your Black History Month presents. Um, so please do buy the book. We have to support uh, these things. And as I've said, this is a very beautiful, this is what I would call a handsome book. A handsome book, yes. You know, that sits on the coffee table. It's lovely. It's absolutely lovely. So do we have questions for Michelle? So we have a couple I think there are microphones. There are microphones here. If someone, while you're making your way there, I'll read you a few of the six word stories yes. that people have shared already. I didn't know I was racist. That. Small black woman, easy to approach. That's Meryl. Mm -hmm. Say it loud, black and proud. Black lives matter. That's Butch. Never quit being your true person. I can't read the first word there. Last name Williams. Variety of races equals strength. It's five, but we'll take it. <laughs> So white, I couldn't see anything. Ooh. No name. I love the diversity of Be More. Uh, this is one, I'm going to say this as the last one. There's one that I can't, this is not six words, but it's interesting. My ancestors were enslaved by President Bush's ancestors. They could care less. <laughs> we'll allow more words. We'll okay. allow it. <laughs> Joy, pain, tradition, and sometimes seen unworthy. And this is one, I love when sometimes stories, I don't know if y'all could read this, the six word stories feel like a little novel. Like, Lost white toddler, kind black boy. Isn't that, don't you just wonder about that? And we need to make America kind again, so I, I like that. Did you have a question? Thank you both so much. I can't even begin the gratitude, but be, the, in the conversation we were having about the flag, it just made me think of a couple of people who I got to meet in Philadelphia who are working on the 250th for 2026. Mm -hmm. And what I said to them was, what an incredible opportunity and what an unbelievably weighty challenge. And I'm just curious how you think about the promise and the challenge of that moment for us in this country? I, I actually see more promise than challenge there because I think it is an opportunity to have an open-armed um, approach to America and to remind people of America and its values and to remind people of how far we've come and maybe challenge the people who want us to, you know, who are challenging so-called CRT you know, who don't want us to look over our shoulder. I, I think it is an opportunity to really interrogate what's at work there. I mean, we are not, I don't believe, my, my faith teaches me that no one person is defined by the worst of their actions. But I know that unless you look at the worst of your actions and take the lessons you will never become the best person that you can be. And I think that that's true for a country also. Unless we're willing to look at those moments where we have lost our way, unless we're willing to understand our moral failings and look at the worst of our actions collectively as a country, 
that we will never as a country find our best, a best manifestation of what it means to be an American. And so I hope that that celebration will be more than just tall ships and, and fireworks, um, but really an examination of what America, who she is and who she can be and, um, and what we all can do to help her get there. Beautiful. Thank you. I'm a descendant of enslaved people who escaped on the Underground Railroad to Canada. And I grew up learning about that story and hearing about it all my life. My great-great-grandmother passed as white, pulled the white people, got on a train, got away. And my great-great-grandfather looked more like me and had to walk most of the way. But as I got older, I wanted to know more about who they were escaping from. And so I sought out descendants of the, ensla of, of the enslavers, and I found some who were very welcoming. They invited me down to see the plantation. They gave me a document where they purchased one of my ancestors in 1817. They showed me the last surviving cabin, slave cabin, and they were wonderful. But when I went to research my great-great-grandfather and the people he escaped from, you read my card, it was the ancestors of President Bush. So I thought, you know, let's write to them, see what they can tell me, see what kind of records they have. First, I wrote to President Bush, completely blew me off, two letters to him. Then I wrote to his daughter, Jenna Bush Hager, who is a host on the Today Show. I thought she's in media, she lives in New York, you know, she's with it, she'll respond. Blew me off too. I wrote to Jeb Bush, same thing. I wrote to Laura Bush, who was on the museum council for the Smithsonian's Museum of African American History and Culture. She blew me off too. <laughs> So I'm working with a reporter now from your old paper, the Washington Post. But my question is to you, what can we do to make people like the Bushes not turn their back on their history of enslavement of our ancestors? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. <laughs> You are so brave in reaching out to them. I, I'm, I've got 18 things going through my mind. So to answer your question, what can you do? You can keep knocking on the door, but you don't, you're not guaranteed an answer. You're not guaranteed an answer. You are so fortunate to find what you found so far. There's a story in the book very similar from someone who um, reaches out to someone, the family, he gets a phone call from someone who is descended from the family that his family once owned. And she would love to have this information. She's, you know, the things that you are able to find, she yearns for that. I bet when you wrote to Jeb and Jenna and Mrs. Bush and former President Bush, I'm not sure that they actually saw those letters. Well, I, I, I have to tell you something else I did. I had a cousin write to his chief of staff at the same address I used. Mm -hmm. She got a response. From the chief of staff? From the chief of staff. But did it actually go to the... I'm not making excuses for them. I just know how things work that they might not, you know, get all the way there. But you sound like you're very persistent. <laughs> and so um, I have a feeling that... You're going to hear from somebody in that family <laughs> at some point, and uh, and and they may want to reach out to you so it happens more on their terms than on on yours. But I applaud you for your um, I applaud you for your perseverance, and I hope that you understand the treasure that you have because so many of us, you know, don't know that. And there has been, you know, you talked about um, some people being fair enough to pass and some people not being fair enough to pass. I mean, there's so many stories about who we are as Americans that, you know, we don't, we don't know, you know, and so much 
mixing in families. I mean, this is one of the sort of strange conundrums of race is that there was so much um, emphasis on, you know, the danger of miscegenation. And yet all around there are people who quite clearly no longer look like the mother continent. So what did you think? We all just faded? <laughs> you know, um, it, yeah, and so, also the one drop rule, which meant, yes. you know, the, the question of definition didn't really make sense. It was counterintuitive because there was the one drop rule and because also of the kind of matrilineal imposition to keep black children from being able to inherit uh, land from their father, who fathers who uh, uh, sired children with, with black women. So there's so much of it that like has gotten it all tangled, you know. But this is this is the thing that I love about this project, and I hope that you will appreciate about the the book, and I appreciate you telling the story tonight. Is as a journalist, um, one of the biggest lessons that I've learned in doing this work is that the conversations that we lead as a journalist, as an academic, as a civil rights attorney the conversations that we're engaged in in the public square is very different than the conversations that people are having in private. There is an intimacy to these conversations and it made me realize in a very humbling way, I've been at this a long time. I am more than three decades into journalism and it realized that I have been engaged in very important conversations, but this is a taproot into something that was unavailable to me. And the conversation that is important to many of you is not reflected in the public square. So these stories that we've collected, yes, when someone, they, you, you maybe find George Floyd's name because we archive all these. His name pops up a few times. President Obama's name pops up a few times. President Trump's name pops up a few times. But what people are really writing about is their lives. So when people write about Freddie Gray, they're not mentioning Freddie Gray's name. They're writing about their son. They're writing about going to work and no one asking them, how are you doing? You know, when people are writing about a crisis at the border, they're not talking about El Paso. You know, they're talking about what's happening when, in their own family. And I, know I wish I had taken the time to learn how to speak Spanish or whatever the story is, but there's an intimacy to these stories. And it is a reminder that there is a hidden conversation that we're not getting to. And there's some benefit in reaching behind that curtain. And, and if we are able to do that to, find those sort of tethers to each other. Um, I, I think that that is one of the things that might help keep us yoked together as a society. Well, we, we need people like you, Michelle, who have the skill, who have the listening skill, um, who have the sensitivity, who have the genuine interest in people to be able to pull these stories out. And as much as we need the politics and the laws and the activism and all of that, we won't make it without this. We won't make it without genuine efforts to help us see one another. And so I'm very grateful to you for this book. Please give another round of applause to Michelle Norris. I'm very grateful to you for this conversation. Love you. I want to thank, I want to take the opportunity to thank our moderator this evening, Sherilyn Eiffel. And again, thank you to our author tonight, Michelle Norris. Now, uh, you're going to buy some books, and Michelle, Michelle's going to sign them. Um, you can't get your library book signed. Ivy Bookshop is here. They have books they want to sell you, and Michelle wants to sign them. So we'll be out there in about five minutes. My colleagues will be out managing the line. We'll see you then.